Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld from Rack N. I'm here to talk to you about day two operations, uh, specifically using Kubernetes upgrades as a process. Rack N uh, is the maintainers of a project called Digital Rebar, and that is part of what we're going to show today. A lot of what we're showing today is standard site reliability engineering or just DevOps practice where you can walk through an upgrade pattern. It's based on a talk we gave at GlueCon uh, uh, this spring called uh, Surviving Day 2 Ops. And it involves a couple of demo patterns where we're actually going to show you Kubernetes upgrades in process uh, that represent these patterns. Uh, Greg Althaus and I presented this. This is just Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, you can see Greg on some other of our other great videos. And it's really important to start with uh, the idea that we are you know, really about open shared operation. Uh, for us, Kubernetes is just the upstream Ansible. Uh, we feel like we don't want to add more installers. That's not really what we're trying to do. We're trying to automate underlay, so build environments with strong, repeatable foundations that are completely automated. That lets us then use standard operating practices that are shared across companies. Very important to us. Uh, it's a note. Uh, this is the we just released 1.7 in Kubernetes, and we're very excited about uh, some of the worker changes in Kubernetes that actually make it even simpler to bring up nodes. So we see this trend of simplification, uh, very straightforward, build a node, add it, join it into an infrastructure and go. Um, and we're all about that process. We think that that's a really exciting uh, transformation going on in the industry. Um, but yet, you know, we have a challenge. People want very quick time to value, right? Uh, Digital Rebar Provision, our, our flagship cobbler replacement uh, service, is designed to be you know, five minutes start to finish, uh, demo on a laptop. Great ways to help drive adoption, but then that translates into assumptions and problems, right? So if you build it like that, uh, like without system D or without reliable uh, site location or making a whole bunch of configuration details, we've just ignored what real ops is about. And that means that we end up with a day two problem. Because day two is much more about you know, known systems, reliable state, complex security configurations, logging, monitoring, all these pieces and parts that aren't Kubernetes or any other application. They're the ops infrastructure that you need around it. And that's really important. And it's hard. Because that means there's a lot of moving pieces. We can't just say, oh, I slapped on the bits. I got everything running. Ping check and move on. We have to figure out how all these pieces are fit together and more challengingly, how they are changed together or changed in parts, because this is a very complex system with a lot of different versioned components. Versioning is moving even more quickly, and we might get cases where I have to change a Docker rev or a Kubernetes rev or an operating system rev all independently. I don't want to lockstep those into a three-month cycle. Right? I want to be continually um, moving through that, which means we have a lot of pieces and parts that have to connect together in very complex ways. Our practice, and what we believe is really important, is composability. Uh, so that you can fit pieces together without having them all intertwine in a way that becomes very hard to make one small change. And we're going to show you how those things work together. Uh, specifically talking around the Kubernetes upgrade demo scenarios. I'll pause the presentation to give you a little bit of a insight into what we've been building uh, in the background here. Uh, so I have uh, some clusters that are coming online right now. Um, one of them is um, cluster one here where I have a couple of systems. It looks like this node hasn't come online yet. And uh, we have a couple of nodes that are waiting to come up in Google. Uh, I'm going to check on where, where these things stand because these sh should be progressing for us to, to show you how to upgrade. So we'll check back on these in a minute and we'll come back to the presentation. So we're back uh, with the clusters. These are our Kubernetes clusters built. Uh, and basically, I've just built two. Uh, they're 161 clusters. If I can go to the admin server, control server here, uh, we use it uh, by default. This is configurable, but we're just using a different port. I have to take the certificates. All pretty standard stuff. Uh, root, change me. All this is configured. go ahead and save the site here. Uh, this is the <laughs> API view. UI is a little bit more friendly. 
here's the nodes. So these nodes are exactly the same nodes that I have over here. And if I drill in on one, uh, say my worker one, you'll see it's, uh, we, it's schedulable. I don't know why they did the double negative. And uh, I can actually see the version. This is the UX. It's actually really, really helpful to show this um, from a, a CLI perspective also. I just need to grab the address. And from here, uh, I can coop cuddle the insecure skip TLS. So uh, the TLS for the site is not all the way set, so I, I'm going to skip it. Uh, I'm going to put in the address, and I'm just going to ask for the nodes list. Um, sorry, I have to say get nodes. Provide my username. So for the demos, uh, let's see. Should be working. Oh, I have to uh, hold on a second. Root. I have to type my password correctly. Always helpful to type your password correctly. Uh, and so in this case, what I've done is we've got the four nodes that I showed you in the UI. Uh, the status, the controller is unscheduled, um, so we don't want to put workloads on it. And it's uh, all 161. So that just is, it gives you a little idea of what we're showing. And I'm about to just jump into the parallel in place. So of our four patterns, this one is pretty straightforward. I changed the version for the deployment, and all of the systems jump to the new deployment, the new version of that deployment. Um, it's a fine upgrade pattern if you're doing a maintenance window type upgrade. So let me show you that uh, in the system. So in digital rebar, let's see, this is my old system. In, uh, in this system, what I can do is I can come into cluster one. I can go to the configuration file. We have a whole bunch of configuration changes to make. I'm just changing the Kubernetes version, so I could even change the Docker version. Uh, way down here, here's my version. I changed the Kubernetes version to 162. I hit update. Uh, at this point, the system doesn't immediately take the change. It realizes that I have I might make multiple variable changes, so it holds off. I commit that change, and now when I look at cluster one, it's no longer ready. It's no longer in the green state. It's identified that these nodes and these roles on these nodes have to be changed based on that change. So I don't have to rerun all the work, just the ones that care about the Kubernetes version. And it's going to rerun our Ansible playbook. Uh, in this case, it's going to fail on the DNS because that's not item potent. Um, so you'll see a red checkbox there, and we can look at what causes that error. But it's going to go through and run this playbook, download the new containers, or all the stuff that you need to do to make this happen. And we'll see that reflected eventually in this, in this list. It's not there yet. So that's, that's process one. It will take the cluster down. Uh, let's see if we can validate that. It won't do it right away. It's going to wait until. Um, it's, it's in the middle, so there might be a pretty small window of downtime, but there is a window of downtime. The beauty here is that I can rehearse this process, test it, see what the downtime is, can find my service window and go. It's very fast. Um, this is probably the fastest way to do any of these upgrade patterns uh, in, that I'm describing. The next one is more controlled, and this is what we would recommend. It's a sequenced in-place upgrade. So what I want to do is take selective, selected nodes, I want to migrate those to the new version in a controlled way, and then ultimately get through my whole cluster uh, in the end. And to do that, we have semantics for that in Digital Rebar also. Um, let me go ahead and show you cluster two. In cluster two, uh, this is our control node. We're going to do the same thing. I'll open up that server. Accepted certificate. And it's, these are two identical deployments that we did um, using their automated classroom setup tool for digital rebar. So just set up two, digital, two Google cloud infrastructures back-to-back, uh, -back, super simple. Um, and so in this case, uh, this is my other deployment. Here's my nodes. Let me grab my address and do the same thing that we've been doing. And once again, this is now in, in 
1.2. So there's something I want to I want to do before I go ahead and take this cluster offline. What I'd really like to do is remove work from that cluster, and, and Kubernetes has the way to do that. I want to say, don't schedule anything new on this this node, and then um, I want you know I could drain it, then I could take my action. So all of this could be done in the API in a way, or sorry, in the CLIs and with scripts in a way that has a very controlled process and can be done in a community shareable way where I'm like, look, here's my process for doing the upgrades. It's known endpoints, known APIs. I can just walk through this process in a scriptable way. So the key here is I want to actually do, say, uh, cordon, C-O-R-D-O-N, and I need to provide the node that I want to cordon. So let's find a node. Uh, cluster 2, we'll use uh, not control, we'll do a worker. And I'm just going to ask for that node, root, well. And now that node has been cordoned. So if I if I do my full nodes list, then it's going to tell you, oh, I can't schedule on worker one. Right. So now that node is not going to get new work. Uh, we have time to drain it, take actions, do things like that. Very important uh, from that perspective to take those takes to actions. For digital rebar, we need a way to make changes for just that one node. We use that a profile system for that. So I can create a new profile. We'll call it Upgrade Me. And we'll add the Kubernetes version in that. K8S. Oops, let's see if I can find it. Way down in here. That's the Docker version. So I could actually change different different components. These are all things that are exposed in the Coop Spray playbooks. Uh, really what we're doing is we're not, we don't have a custom Kubernetes install, we're just using the Kubernetes deployment uh, scripts that are in community for Ansible. Let's see, Docker version, no. Somewhere way down deep in this list is the Kubernetes version. A lot of stuff in this. Oh, hold on a second. I think I started typing, no. Uh, it's frustrating when I can't find stuff, and the sort order in this is not alphabetical. All right, so K8 scoop version, yay, it's right there. So in this case, same thing, 162, I'm going to create this upgrade me profile. So any nodes in that profile, will o we will override the parameter instead of at the deployment level, we will uh, do it at the um, node level. Uh, so what I can do back here is this deployment is still running in the 161 version up here, so it won't change. Um, but the cluster worker one, I can edit this node. I can add the profile upgrade me. All of this, of course, is, you can do in an automated way through the the rebar CLIs, and at that point I can then retry the specific worker uh, for cluster 2. So cluster 2 is going to come along and it's going to rerun the Ansible script just on that one node. So the whole we don't rerun the whole playbook, we just run that one node, mini inventory file, that one change, um, very prescriptive change, and it will go and impact that Kubernetes worker and bring it up to speed. And since it's not scheduled, there's no interruption in the cluster. So the cluster is still working, doing its thing. And now what's going to happen is we're upgrading it. At the end of this process, uh, when we verified it's in 162, we're going to then swap in and, and uncoordin it. Right? And it'll be able to take workload. And that's how we can go through this uh, incremental uh, upgrade process, uh, keeping the infrastructure in place. It's a very good process to do these incremental 1.6, 1.2, 1.3. You know, dot releases where I have to do a patch. Having this type of process where you can rip through the nodes in a controlled way uh, and then monitor it, which is really helpful because um, I get high transparency on what the system's doing exactly at every every step. Uh, it looks like our system, we're going to fail on this kubeDNS. Um, our system over here, our other, other first cluster, uh, let's see, they actually both have the same ending uh, octet. That's really interesting. The 
happens. Unless I'm just going back to the same cluster every time and, and people watching the video are like, Rob, you went back to the same cluster every time. Um, let's see, so here's cluster 1, 131. All right. This is right. Um, so this is now all upgraded to 162. Oh, I did it right, so that's cluster 2. Um, <laughs> I'm just acting a little dyslexic because I'm reading 131 and 113 is the same number. So here we have all the nodes upgraded, so that's cluster 1. Everything's upgraded to 162. Uh, and we're waiting for our second cluster, 113, to complete the process. And it's not it's not all the way through yet so let me jump go forward a little bit in the presentation so the other options that we have in a deployment are immutable round robin which is a really interesting pattern it means this is typical in cloud where what you do is you bring in new nodes with a new version so the 162 versions would would not be patched they would actually we build new nodes that had the new version um, just like I, I'm applying profiles to the nodes I can do exactly the same thing uh, in creating a new node so I could add a new node with that new version number and then remove the nodes with the old version so the way you change the system out is literally by just um, adding new, new nodes uh, with the new version removing old nodes with the old version um, very effective people do this in cloud um, it gives you a lot of control because you're not trying to make sure that your docker version is compatible with the new stuff so there's less moving parts if you want to think about it that way it's really not less moving parts. It's just we're not we're not trying to change. We don't have to be as composable. Um, and if you paid attention earlier, composability to me is a is a benefit. So we we do you know it sort of lets us cheat. It's not a bad thing um, if it reduces your complexity for an install. If you don't have a cloud um, and you have just physical resources, what you're going to do is you're going to do immutable an immutable redeploy. So instead of adding new nodes and removing them, you're going to take serviceable nodes, re-image them and then set them up as a, as a new node. So it's effectively destroy and recreate. Uh, we think this pattern is really exciting. Um, it, it has a lot of hardware churn or a lot of OS deployment churn. Uh, and that's, that means that you have to have a more active system and manage it a little bit more. But the simplicity and the ability to continually reset your system is really powerful. I would suggest this pattern even if you're not upgrading. So imagine a weekly refresh where all of the systems in your environment get reset, rebuilt, and re-imaged. It reduces the risk of them getting out of phase or having keys on them they're not supposed to have or, or malware on them they're not supposed to have. So your attack surface goes down because there's no systems that are out of control. And then when you need to slipstream in a patch or an OS change or something like that, it's just going to roll through this infrastructure. Uh, some people in immutable thinking, they don't even install the operating system, they just run it in memory. Um, and that's a really good pattern for this, so the data stays on the disks. Uh, it doesn't create the same re-imaging benefit if the data is still on the disk, um, but uh, you know that's, that's the pros and cons. The operating system is really the vulnerability point uh, more than the data disk uh, would be. So that, those are the, the four primary patterns we want to highlight in this. Let's see how our deployments are doing. And you can see in this case, uh, worker one is now upgraded. So I can uh, go back through it. And instead of uh, cordoning it, I can uncordon. And at that point, the system is uh, back up online and it's, it's available into the cluster and it would start taking work immediately. Uh, obviously this approach only works if the worker is compatible with the control plane. If otherwise you're back in the, the you know, do everything at once type of deployment. Um, but even in a big bang deployment, you might still want to stage things where you do all the workers at once, then the control nodes. Um, and the processes I'm showing you can be used to control how a rollout is done in a very granular way. And that ultimately is what you want. You want to automate these deployments like crazy so that you can rehearse, 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 rehearse on cloud, rehearse on a lab, rehearse everywhere you can so that those scripts are bulletproof and you know where they're going to fail. Um, speaking of failures, I can show you uh, this is the as predicted 
uh, DNS did, did not reinstall correctly. So when we re-ran the script, I believe this is fixed in the latest Coop spray. Um, this is a, a slightly older version. We haven't we haven't updated to the last uh, tag yet. So um, so basically, you can see exactly what happened. And if I scroll all the way down in this list, if I can. You'll we'll actually see what the error message is. It's the benefit of these live logs uh, out of Ansible is we could go back through and figure out exactly what happened. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, not going to try and troubleshoot it right here. Um, I do want to point out there is one more upgrade pattern um, that we see quite a bit, although it's it's a bit of an anti-pattern. It's something I call lily pad migration. So instead of being able to patch your system, if you can't do that, uh, you can set up a system with the new version. So 1.6, Kubernetes 1.6 to 1.7 migration. You might set up 1.7 and then move work, you know, have people move their workloads to the new, uh, the new system and slowly drain capacity out of the old. Uh, this is, it, it's really helpful if you can't do an upgrade but it's uh, it exposes to the users that you can't do upgrades and it forces them to change their workloads and it can be really hard to get the last people off of that cluster uh, so while it's a, a workable thing and and i wouldn't feel you know i wouldn't go home and kick your dog uh, if you have to use this process there's no shame in it it's it's fine uh, it does have some costs and if you if you need to be in this type of deployment model uh, it's worth understanding what the costs are uh, when you embrace it. Overall, right, we really want people to plan, rehearse, and then share how they're doing upgrades and what they're doing. Our goal with Digital Rebar is that we can create a community around ops best practices. We, we really see everybody's done things their own way on their own infrastructure and everybody's a snowflake. And that's not adding any value to people's jobs. Uh, these open source projects are great places for us to share and reuse and learn and work together. Because if we don't have upgrades that everybody can use, it's going to slow down adoption. It's going to stretch out how long we have to support versions. There's a whole bunch of challenges for the community if we aren't sharing upgrade best practices and patterns. And that's a lot of what we've been trying to do um, ever since the early, early OpenStack days when um, our team first started thinking through how we would do this type of scripted automated upgrade process. If you want to get in touch with us, ask us more questions. My name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, I am CEO and co-founder of Rack N. Uh, this presentation, uh, a lot of it goes, gets credit to Greg Althaus, our CTO. Um, absolutely brilliant guy about thinking these types of things through and uh, communities in general. So. We'd love to talk with you and, and interact with you and, and see how we can work together to make uh, operations and day two operations much more repeatable, shared, and best practice. Thank you.